Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to SFU's Big Data Hub. Uh, my name is Dugan O'Neill. I'm the Associate Vice President Research. And I want to begin today by acknowledging that we're privileged to be doing this work on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. So on behalf of SFU, uh, welcome to our 2018 Data Visionary Series. Uh, this series is dedicated to bringing together pioneers in the field who shape and reshape the world. And we have one of those pioneers with us today, one of our own, uh, of whom we're very proud. So I'd like to encourage you to, to join the online conversation as well uh, at hashtag SFUKey or hashtag Data Visionaries. Um, about today's uh, presentation and today's speaker. So sensing technology for robots has improved dramatically in the last few years, um, but we don't see robots uh, around us yet, um, though maybe if you visited Richard's lab, you would see them all around you. Um, how should robots behave around people, animals, and each other in order to get things done is uh, an interesting question. So our presenter today is Professor Richard Vaughn. Uh, he will describe a series of vision-mediated human-robot interactions with teams of driving and flying robots. Uh, his group works on behavioral strategies for mobile robots that exploit the new sensing capabilities, allows them to perform sophisticated, robust interactions with the world and with other agents. Um, and this is why he is so, so pleased to introduce Richard Vaughn. Uh, he's an SFU professor of computing science where he directs the Autonomy Lab. His research interests include multi-robot systems, robot energy and resource management, uh, human robot interaction, robot software engineering, and behavioral ecology. Uh, he demonstrated the first robot control of animal behavior, co-founded a project that made open source standards in robotics, and showed the first uninstrumented human interaction with flying robots. He serves as the on the administrative committee of the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, Robotics and Automation Society, and the editorial board of the Autonomous Robot Journal. So on behalf of Key, please join me in welcoming a pioneering big data leader, Richard Vaughn. Hello, can you hear me okay? Okay, um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Oh, I gave my first slide away. So often you see people end their talk with a photograph of the people in their lab, and then they say, oh, of course, these are the people that, that did the real work. I think that's so important that I put it on the first slide. So many of these guys are here in the front row. So it's, I'm the front man for this uh, group of people, that, and you see the uh, current generation in the front row here. So um, it's, it's their work that we're doing. Um, I founded the lab here about 15 years ago, and we've done a series of, uh, of projects, and I'll show you stuff from about the last uh, six years, I think. Um, okay, so, how should human-robot interaction be done? Um, if, we, if humans are going to work together with robots, we, we, the, the vision for humans and robots working together is that we can do useful things with robots. Robots can do things that people can't do. Our skills complement each other. We should work together to, uh, uh, to make the world a better place. How do we do this? Well, I'm going to argue today that, we, uh, that our culture has been examining this question of how humans should interact with intelligent agents for thousands of years. So we already have a bunch of answers to these questions, but we haven't really framed them in, in human-robot interactions. So some of the inspiration for the work we've, that we've done has been taken from the broader culture and, on how to interact with intelligent things, not robots, but existing intelligent things. So for example, um, this is a still from a wonderful sci-fi movie, Big Hero 6. How many people have seen Big Hero 6? Yeah, it's very good. I'll, I'll come back to it at the end again. Um, so here's a vision of how you interact with a robot. It's a very intimate relationship that these guys have. Now, this is way beyond the state of the art. In fact, the, the form factor of the robot, the squishy inflatable thing, that's actually real. It's based on a robot from uh, CMU. Uh, but the behavior of the robot um, is completely science fiction right now. So this is, we can't aim for this just yet. But when I was a kid, this is what human-robot interaction looked like in fantasy. This is from 1976, I think. So I was about five years old, or 77. Um, this is one of the, the uh, one of the most important scenes from um, from Star Wars universe when Princess Leia gives the Death Star plans to R2D2, and she trusts that R2D2 understood what she meant. Here are the Death Star plans. Many somethings have died for these things. Right? We find this out later. Right? But this is really, really important. So this interaction has to work first time, um, and she has to know that R2D2 understands, and this interaction has to be high quality. Um, so maybe this, is a, maybe this is a little simpler than Baymax, right? R2-D2 doesn't talk, 
but you can kind of understand what he's um, thinking. And he can definitely understand what you're thinking. Right? So maybe we can get closer to this interaction. Um, going back a little bit further, in 1940, um, Walt Disney Company um, ha had this, uh, this movie in which uh, Mickey Mouse is giving instructions to these autonomous brooms. Right? These are magical brooms. They're not robots. They're magic. But he gives them commands to sweep up the place with um, amusing results. Um, but the interface that the, um, that the storytellers chose to use was this gestural interface. So Mickey commands the robots to do things like that. It's very cinematic, right? Um, but people have been thinking about how do you command an intelligent system um, in, in different modalities. So uh, there's voice and there's gestures and there's facial interactions. And we understand what Mickey's saying here, right? We also have a long history of... Um, interfaces, that is, means whereby humans can express their intentions to, um, to other intelligence systems, non-human animals in this case. So the repertoire for a, a trained sheepdog is about 20 or 25 different commands. And uh, if you've ever seen a, um, a professional um, shepherd and sheepdog team, it's absolutely, it's absolutely amazing what they can do. Uh, the dog here understands a, a library of commands, including uh, whistles and spoken commands and hand gestures. And they work together as a team. And we've been doing this for thousands of years. Um, also, this works with um, air vehicles as well, or intelligent agents that fly. So um, most cultures have uh, hunting with birds, and we've had this for thousands of years as well. And the great thing about this is it works over these enormous scales. So the bird has incredible eyesight and hearing, and you can call this bird down from 400 meters away, no problem. The bird can see you really, really well. At that point, you can hardly see the bird, but the bird sees you really well. So they use gestures um, to, to call down the birds from the tree. So this works in a bunch of different modalities and has done for thousands of years. So, so we already know how to express our intent to other intelligent agents. So we want to use that kind of inspiration um, and apply that to the robot domain. Excuse me a second. I have a cold. I'm so hopped up on cold medicine. Ah. Um, here's another a wonderful interaction that really changes the life of people that use um, um, assistive, assistive dogs. Um, here, the, um, there's a, a series of commands that this trained dog understands and, the, um, and a relatively large number of vocal commands, for example. The vocabulary of these dogs is, in the, um, is, is at least in the tens of words, maybe, maybe larger. So it changes the life um, of people that use these trained animals. So back to, uh, back to Luke and Leia. Now, most um, Luke and Leia, R2-D2 and Leia, excuse me, um, most human-robot interaction research in the world is done, looks just like this. You have a robot across the table from a human, and um, you might have a repertoire of gestures or, or, um, or vocal commands, or um, robots uh, are able to track your eye gaze from close range. This is what 90% of HRI looks like. So here's an example from Elizabeth Croft's lab at UBC. So Elizabeth does this wonderful work uh, where she, work, um, she wants humans and robots to work together to do manip manip manipulation tasks without the human being damaged in the process, right? Because even this PRT robot, which is a little bit springy, will hurt you if it bonks you. So um, Elizabeth's work is to make sure that the robot doesn't bonk you, basically. Right? So most HRI work is like this. Um, human and robot um, in close proximity with uh, their attention already focused on a shared task. So I wanted to um, look at a different set of the, um, of the interaction space that wasn't really looked at before, and that's how does the human and the robot, how do they get into this relationship in the first place? Right? If you want to, um, if I want to get into a one-on-one -on -one interaction with one of you, I have to get your attention, and we have to move together, and we have to establish a new domain where we're actually attending to the same thing. So we want to manipulate the attention of the robot, and the, hu the human and robot manipulate each other's attention um, to get to set up these one-on-one -on -one interactions. So that's what this work is about. So this is the oldest piece of work, um, and this is an example where Yaroslav is getting the attention of one robot at a time from a population. And I deliberately haven't told you how he's doing it. Can you see how he's getting the robot's attention? So exactly one robot at a time is attending to him. And it's the robot that has the, um, what color is it? The, the white lights flashing. Do you see how he's doing it? Well, that's, it's kind of good that it's not obvious, because it's really very easy. He just looks at the robot he's interested in. Super simple. I can get one of your attention by staring right at you. I'm sorry, it's, it's not a very nice thing to do to you. But everybody else knows that I'm not looking at them, and you know that I'm looking at you. Super simple, right? So if this room is full of robots, that stuff just works. So, um, excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. 
So that was an example of, um, I've just lost a bunch of videos. How did that work? Forgive me, these are somewhat scrambled. All right, so we'll, we'll do them in the order they come up in. Oh, man. Um, so the way this works under the hood is that for e each robot has an estimate of how directly it's being looked at by the human face. And we have very, very uh, distinctive looking faces. Our faces are designed um, to be targets for, for the human visual system to look at. Right? They're, it, they're, it's no coincidence that our faces are all the same shape and have the same strong features. They're designed to be looked at. So we can exploit that in the computer and, uh, um, and estimate how directly you're being looked at. And then the robots have a superpower that animals don't have, which is that they can communicate with each other very quickly over the uh, wireless network. So these robots trade with each other these scores, and then they pick the one with the highest score. And that takes about 300 milliseconds, so the human doesn't perceive that time. So when the robot's in front of you, you look from robot to robot, and the robot you're looking at, the lights come on. And it just works exactly the way you, you want it to. So that's picking one robot from a, a group of robots at a time. And we were the first people to do that with uninstrumented human. The next thing we want to do is to pick a subset of robots, a group of robots, from a larger group of robots. So here, um, Brian Milligan is doing this by circling the robots he's interested in. And the robots uh, form a team, indicated in blue. And then they read a, a simple uh, gesture command uh, to go and do a task to the right or to the left. But we abstracted the task away. They just drive to the right or the left, depending which way you point. Right? Now, this one is quite neat. Um, I can demonstrate this one to you. So if, I can tr if you can track my face and my hand, I can select you guys so you know with maybe some fuzziness on the edges, whether you're in the group or not. You guys are not in the group. You guys are in the group. You guys are on the boundary. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Right? So how do you do that? If my face is inside the ellipse described by my hand, you're in the group. If it's outside, you're not. Super simple, right? But that's the kind of thing that with the computer vision systems back in 2011 that we were just about able to do indoors reliably. Check hands and faces. So that was the first example of um, selecting a, a co-located group of robots from a population with an uninstrumented human. Just to point out, uh, unlike the other work at the time, uh, Brian is not wearing a traffic cone on his head and yellow gloves or magic wand or anything. Right? It's, he's just wearing the clothes he uh, came to work in every day. In fact, in his case, literally every day. <laughs> Sorry, Brian, if you see this. All right, so, so now we've selected one robot from a population. Um, uh, we selected a group of robots from a population. Um, but I mentioned this fuzziness on the boundary. So it's possible that I got somebody in the group that I didn't want, intend to, either in or out. So what I'd like to be able to do is to create and modify groups. I don't, can we have the sound up on the, from the computer? No? Okay. It was working when we, before we started. I'll, I'll play the role of uh, Shock Affair in these videos. So Shock Affair is looking at the robot that she's interested in, and she says, you too. And so what we do now is we do two rounds of this election where the, the robots discuss with each other who's being talked at. And, she, and she's, uh, when she says, you two, so you two take off. Now, which two? It's the two robots she was looking at. So you two take off, or these two take off. These are the ones she was gazing at. And she says again. And now she says, you three. And she gazes at each robot in turn. This is a little awkward because the robot's cameras are actually pointed downwards a little bit. So forgive how clumsy this looks. It's better if they're flying. All right, so she said, now all three are in the group now. And then she says, not you. And that removes this robot from the group. Now she can say, take off. And the current, uh, current group takes off. So now we're able to uh, create groups of robots that are not actually co-located anymore. They can be anywhere. And you can modify them. You can add robots to the group, take them away. That was also the first time that that had been done. So I'm going to go, I'll go back to the video that was out of order. So here, this is the first um, um, command and control of flying robots with an uninstrumented user um, in the lab in the next building here. Um, so here, Manny um, is uh, going to get the attention of a robot by looking at it. These video feeds are, are what the robot sees. So this is the entire input to the robot. The robots, are, they take off and they try and, keep it, they try and keep a human's face roughly in the middle of their field of view. So raving your right hand adds the robot to the team. So now both robots are in the team. And then raving his other hand removes a robot from the team. So now the team has been modified again. And then two hands, then he adds it back. And then two hands means uh, the whole team should do the mission. 
This mission's very short, but spectacular. Um, so we're able to do robustly in the lab now, um, or, or back then, um, this thing where we're manipulating the robot's attention. We're creating groups of robots that are paying attention to me, and I'm able to give them simple tasks. So we're kind of inching towards the R2-D2 um, layer situation, and getting robots from going about their business to getting together to pay attention to humans in uh, single robots, multiple robots, and, and even flying robots. And this is back when uh, drones were, were very new. So putting these things together, let's see if we have sound now. No sound, okay. So all right, I'm gonna have to pl play the sound. So putting these things together into a system, this robot now, um, what the robot loves to do is take secret, pl uh, sorry, not secret plans, softballs from people and uh, give them to other people. So um, Shokafe is gonna uh, give the ball to the robot and she indicates the fact that she wants to give it a softball just by reaching out to the robot. We play that again in case you missed that. So that what the robot does is it likes to find people. So Zhao says there's a person over there, so um, it looks over there. Now it finds some legs, it finds a body, it finds the long bones of the body, it finds a face, and it finds a hand, and then it, it detects this reaching gesture. So there's this huge, this long pipeline of sensing that we put together. Now it has a softball, it wants to give it to somebody else, so it's gonna um, try and find another person in the room. So it sees some legs over at a distance, it gets a bit closer, it sees a body, it gets a bit closer, it sees the long bones of the body, and now it says, woo, to indicate that it's paying attention to Zhao. And then it says, do 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 and then Zhao ignores the robot and it says, ooh, and turns away. I wish you could have heard it. Anyway, I'll do my best. Um, Shokafe doesn't want the softball, but she points that way. Then the robot goes, and this time it will drive up to Zhao and go, whoop, woo, because it likes, it likes to give and receive softballs. Right? So now it's not secret plans, it's softballs, but we're getting to the point where we can uh, transfer things from user to user, and we don't have to explain how to do this. In fact, I, didn't, I, I don't have a video because we didn't have their permission, but we have, the, we have a parent of one of the kids we tried this out on in the lab, in the, in the audience today. So we, we, uh, we told the kids, just stand there and give and take the softball, and it, it worked pretty well without any training to the kids. All right, so um, that's all back in about 2011, 12, 13. Um, the, Unsatisf unsatisfying thing about this work is how small the domain is. It's, it's in the lab under controlled lighting conditions with people who kind of know what they're doing. And we'd like to expand this so that we can um, do it over, over large distances, uh, large scales out in the world, and in particular outdoors where the lighting is difficult. Any of you who've done any computer vision, uh, at least until very recently, will know that one of the most challenging things is getting the vision system to work under varied lighting conditions. A real challenge. If you, if you change the lights in this room, Everything looks totally different. Everything's a different color. Everything has different shadows. Everything is really different. Um, it's very hard to understand how different it is because your brain is super good at knowing the differences. But for com computer vision people will know that uh, you change the lighting a little bit or the uh, sun goes behind a cloud, you're in a different world. Right, so let's say now you want to get R2-D2's attention, but R2-D2 is far, far away. Um, how do we do that? So that's what R2-D2 looks like right now. You want to get him and give him the secret plans. So let's find out. Um, we would like to, uh, to design an interaction that's natural for pe people to do, that they already know how to do. So let's find out what do people do if you ask them, make the robot come to you. So we looked in the literature and couldn't find a reference for this. So we just do the experiment. This is the, the work of uh, Shokafe Pomer in my lab. So this is what the experiment looks like. We put a, um, a fairly ordinary lab robot eight meters away from the uh, person. Uh, the person who's waving is a, an, an innocent volunteer, and the other people are distractors. They're, they're my grad students. And uh, Shokafe is actually joysticking the robot behind her back so that the uh, experimenter can't tell if the robot's autonomous or not. In this case, it's not autonomous. So, and the instructions are, make the robot come to you. That's all we tell them. We also tell them that don't move their feet. Okay. So this is what people do when you tell them, make the robot come to you. And again, the lack of sound is a, is a shame. Maybe I'll just, I'll just, I can't unplug it for the camera either. Okay, so what they're doing is they're, they're like, Come here, robot. Hey, robot, robot, over here. Hey, robot, good robot. Come this way. Robot, robot. So that's what they do. And then they do this. So people do interesting things. Um, they do this gesture a lot. 
This is a good one. This is really big on the camera, right? So if I'm facing the camera over there, this is the biggest gesture I can make with respect to the, my image on the, on the um, sensor of the camera. So this is good. This one is really bad. It's very difficult to see. It's a small gesture for the, as far as the camera is concerned. Um, all right, so we can classify the kind of things people do. They do clapping. They make loud noises to get the attention. This works pretty well. They do big waving gestures like this. They do uh, this gesture a lot. Um, and uh, they, uh, uh, this, um, this woman had this interesting one where she was kind of steering the robot like this. This is what, we, what she made up. This guy, I don't know what his plan was, but he did exactly nothing. <laughs> That's honestly what he did, and he did it repeatedly. Um, so if you ever need a reference now for what do robots do when you say, mate, you know, come, you know, robot come to you, That's, this is what they do. All right, so we wanted um, the gesture that, we, um, that people did spontaneously for robots that were far away and is most convenient for us sensor-wise is this gesture. So we're going to use this gesture. Now, one of our students is in this image. Um, this is up um, by the bus loop up there. Um, and can you see where the student is? It's very difficult, but when we start the video, you can see him waving. You see him there? on the path, well, the robot can see this gesture pretty well. So what we do is we look for small patches of Im image that are varying repeatedly at about two hertz. Um, so this is good. We can, find, we can detect this two hertz vibration uh, really accurately. There's Chris by the tree. Um, annoyingly, this is also two hertz. Almost exactly, right? So we have a problem. We have to disambiguate between this and this and uh, from a long distance away. And the way we do that is um, if you're stationary with respect to the background, then we think that's a signal. If you're moving with respect to the background, we think that's walking and we'll ignore it. That's why the robot has to stand still and look. So that's a big limitation. But um, we have the uh, world record for getting the attention of a robot from uh, what, what it was, 60 meters away or something. People are tiny. They're eight pixels high at that point. But it works really robustly. Now, we want to do, um, we would like to remove this constraint because we, it's not convenient to have the robot stand dead still and wait to see things vibrating. You want to remove this constraint. So we do this the hardest possible way we can. We do it on a UAV, a flying robot. And that means the camera is always moving. You cannot keep the camera still. You try and hover as still as you like, the camera is still moving. Right? Because in order to hover, the robot is actually pitching and rolling to stay in place. The camera is moving all the time. So this is the first example of. Um, getting the attention of a UAV in flight uh, by an uninstrumented person. So here we're going to uh, detect this grad student here. We're ignoring him on purpose on this round, while ignoring the running guy, who also has a, two, a strong 2 hertz signal. Uh, so that waggle there, where the camera waggles, that's the um, universal symbol for, from a pilot to say, I see you. you know, if you're lost in the, in the wilderness and a pilot sees you, they waggle the wings of their plane, right? Did you know that? That's what that means. So we get the UAV to do that as well. Now, by this time, the, um, we have to distinguish between things that are stationary with respect to the background and things that are moving. And this is actually quite challenging to do when the whole world is moving all the time, as far as the camera is concerned. So to do this, we actually have to construct a complete um, 3D visual odometry solution, compute um, a 3D model of the world, and then track the world as it's moving in 3D, cancel that out to get the ground reference frame, and find things that move with respect to that. So this is, there's a, lot, it's a long, complex visual pipeline that was absolutely at the edge of the state of the art at the time. It's all running on the, on the robot in flight. Now, so now we're able to grab the attention of a robot from far away, on the ground or in the air, and we're able to give, uh, robustly uh, detect gestures up close. So what we'd like to do now is to call R2-D2 from far away and give him the secret plans, um, or uh, the analog of that, so this is from uh, 2016. This video inset is from the, um, is the, the robot's camera view. So this is the input to the robot. There's a couple of my students there. Um, there's Seppa with a scarf on. And then an innocent bystander going towards the bus. The robot successfully avoids the innocent bystander. We have a pretty bad person detector. You can see it's a bit sketchy. But when we see people vibrating at two hertz and not moving with respect to the background, the robot locks onto it like this. All right. Now the robot indicates to Seppa that he's being tracked. And now the robot can do this visual servo from far to near. Um, and I'm really, really pleased with how well this works. Uh, because the robot's coming towards you, your appearance is changing in every single frame. You're, you're getting a lot bigger. When the robot gets close enough, it sees your face. We detect the gesture. 
This is take a selfie, that's the selfie. And then this gesture is bye-bye, we're done. End of the engagement, right. So this is the first time that we managed to pull a robot um, out of the sky, come towards us, and give it a, a direct individual command using these different modalities. And um, it's, a, um, it's very easy to, to say that, but that was about 18 months of work between those two videos, right, by really, really talented engineers. Um, so it was just about doable at the time. Um, and many, many things didn't work. So let's talk about th things that are just about doable. So we use these gestures because they were easy and doable at the time. The way we can do this is we can track faces easily because faces have this T shape on them and, and such. Um, and then we can track motion fairly easily. So we designed a gesture system that exploited faces and motion. And so we pay attention to motion um, either side of the face in these kind of two hot, hot spots. Sorry, face. So this pink here is detecting the motion in the several recent frames. So that's what we were using. Um, that works well in the lab. It works well enough outdoors. But it really limited the, um, um, the richness of the vocabulary we could do. Depending where you put the boxes, we could have a few different gestures, but not too many. But something happened um, around 2015-16. The computer vision stuff started to work really well. Most of you have heard of deep neural networks by now. And one of the... Um, uh, one of the things that deep convolutional neural networks are really, really good at is uh, robust detection of, of objects given sufficient training data. They're very, very good at that. So things got a lot better. So this is what we can do now, or what we could do in, in 2017. Now, it looks like we're tracking hands and faces among, on these, among these happy students. Um, in fact, we're not tracking. We're, de we're detecting them individually in each frame. It's just that the detection is so good that it looks like we're following them. But for each frame is completely independent. So if you've ever done computer vision before 2016, this was really surprising. This was a big, big step forward compared to this clunky stuff that we just about got working before. So we can take this, these things and go back to the original system. So this is what the system, this is what we can do now. Um, so in this whole, this whole video, the robot is completely autonomous, and we're going to do uh, close range interaction between two different people and send the robot between people um, outdoors under um, arbitrary lighting conditions and also show you a new thing, which is um, um, a, a new kind of gesture command, which we can do now. So Pratik is going to command the robot to take off, which he does by telling it it's ready and then take off. The robot takes off, the robot spins around, goes up to altitude and then looks for interesting people. Now, interesting people, remember, are people who wave at the robot. So Seppa will pull. These are other... You can see anything if you stare into a tree long enough, um, but you, you don't see waving people very often. So now the robot has acquired Sepper, and the robot ha shines a bright light um, so that Sepper can tell that it sees him, so he doesn't have to keep signaling. And the robot approaches Sepper, and when it finds his hands and face, it, it uh, detects them. And now this is the, the new thing, so world first. Um, we're joysticking the robot in continuous space. We're not saying, you shall go left or right. We're, we're actually controlling the speed of the robot smoothly, continuously. We can still do gestures as well. Go down. So this is a world first as well. I, I still don't get tired of looking at how good these detections are. So this hand and face detector, it's a single neural network that detects hands and faces. It has similar performance to the best face detectors in the world. It has the best performance in hand detection in the world, but it does them both at once, and it does it 60 frames a second. All right, so this is a story of how we've managed to take the, um, uh, the manipulation of the attention of, of a robot, and we've managed to take it outdoors. Um, we're doing it over relatively large scales, and we can do it in two domains. We can do these discrete gestures, take a selfie, and, and take off, and we can do continuous gestures where we go right or we go up and down. And each of these things is the, um, uh, the first example that we ever saw in the world. However, um, the drone industry is uh, very close behind us. So um, I should have run that before. It's the case now that you can go and buy a drone from DJI, a very, very successful and well-financed Chinese company that hires brilliant engineers. Um, and they are uh, catching us up fast. We can still do more than they can right now, or at least in products. But it's time, to f it's time for my group to stop doing this stuff, because these guys are going to do it anyway. 
right? And they will, we don't want to spend the taxpayers' money on stuff that the, uh, uh, a very, very talented uh, group of uh, Chinese engineers are going to do in a year anyway. So we'll move on to other things. Right? So that's the end of our, um, the, the, the end of the uh, exploring this space. So it's a commercial product now. You can go buy this stuff. See, so he's doing the same selfie gesture that we do. And these robots will follow you around. Let's talk quickly then about a couple of other things we do. Uh, pointing is a, a universal gesture. There's lots and lots of uh, human robot interaction work in pointing. Now, this um, young, untrained human can do it very well. Uh, the, it works over large scales. So there's, there's a lot of people in front of David Bowie right now, and they all understand what he's doing. Um, animals can understand it. Animals can do it, which is interesting. Right? This dog is pointing to a bird that's fallen in the, uh, in the grass. Um, so uh, uh, Bita Azari, who's here today, she, she took the hand of face tracker, used it on a depth camera. So we find the hands of faces, and we look in the depth image, and then we can find the, these hands of face points in 3D. Then we do some elementary statistics on these points on the hand, points on the face, and to generate a, a vector from, the, uh, from your eye through your hand into space. So now we can do this pointing really robustly. So this stuff just works, just like you always wanted to. You, I stand in front of an RGBD camera. I can just point, and it, it works just like that. Um, so, and we give all this software away um, open source. So instead of every experiment having to implement this from scratch, they can use our code now. So we, hopefully we sort of nailed that for a useful subset of the population. Another thing I'm really interested in these days, and I think we're going we're to push forward on this project now, is following. So they knew in 1940 that following was important. There's an autonomous magical agent following Mickey Mouse. Um, uh, following is very well studied in the literature, um, and it works really, really well. So this is um, uh, Boston Dynamics robot, big dog, following, um, some, uh, following a person for a demonstration for the Marine Corps in the US. It works really, really well. However, you don't always want the robot behind you. I don't want that Marine to stand on a mine and get his leg blown off while the robot's fine. Right? It should be exactly the other way around. Right? So the, the robot should be in front. The intelligent agent should be in front, right? It's, you want to, the, the, the robot can, wants to do its thing before anything bad happens to the human. It turned out that we found two references about this in the history of robotics, and the, uh, the last one was old. 12, 15 years old? Old, Payam? Old. So no one's done following but in front. So Payam's master's thesis was uh, uh, really, really lovely. So it's a kind of a, a crude indoor demo. So the robot now is tracking Payam, and it's... it's it's guessing where he's going to go and going there before he does and trying to stay about a meter in front of him. So he thinks a bunch of applications for this. So that's, that was easy in, the, um, in that setting, but now we have an option. Now in this case, the robot is going to get it wrong. And Payam's indication to the robot to you got it wrong was just like, and the robot kind of figures it out and dumps it in front of you. Now, this is crude right now, but, but it's unique in the world, and I think... I'm really excited about this because I think there's a lot of places for this to go. You can put the robot further out in front of you, right? Maybe, maybe 30 seconds in front of you. Now it has to have a really good estimate for where you're going to go. Um, we can have flying robots, ground robots. This is really interesting. We have a, a shopping cart for people who are on crutches or something. I mean, I'm stretching a little bit, but there's a lot of things you can do with a robot that follows you but in front. For a cinematography robot, it could be a camera that can follow you when you're skiing or surfing. Instead of getting the back of your head, it can get your face while you're skiing or surfing, which is kind of exciting. So I'm, I think this is a thing we're going to be exploring in the future. So the, the, the take-home message here is that um, one way of doing human-robot interaction, uh, it's a subset of the whole space, and most, most other people don't do it like this, is to try and do interactions which don't even feel like interactions to the human. It's human-robot interaction just like you always knew it should be, just like it is in the movies, where the, uh, the robot interacts with you like a, uh, with the same level of competence of a trained animal and the same kind of interface which is very low, uh, low effort for you. Right. But so what? Why do you care about any of this? You don't have a robot problem in your life right now. In fact, you don't have a robot. If you have a robot, you probably have a Roomba. It has one big button marked clean on it. And the interface for that is great. That's really good. Um, so who cares about this stuff? Well, any day now, you're going to be surrounded by robots. Uh, this is happening um, inevitably. So robots, uh, sorry, uh, autonomous cars will have to interact with people at intersections downtown. That's going to have to happen. So 
This is a kind of idealized example. This is an indoor setting in a lab in Audi's lab in Germany. Everyone's doing, behaving very nicely. This is the English version. This is the, um, this, this is the uh, probably the world's most famous crosswalk, second famous after Abbey Road. Uh, this is the uh, Shinjuku station in Japan. The, imagine a near future when a subset of these vehicles will be robots. Now here, everyone's pretty well behaved. Um, the robots and people are mostly separated, and people are following the rules. It's Japan, after all. Uh, this is India. Uh, different, people have a different way of going about things there. So imagine now that a subset of these cars and buses are autonomous, that somehow they've got to get through this crowd. They've got to make some progress today, preferably. They've got to really not hurt anybody, and the people have to know what's going, what's going on. The robot is going to have to indicate to someone, I'm going here, I'm trying not to kill you, don't make me kill you. Some interaction is going to have to happen here. So this is a problem that we need to solve. And using these kind of techniques where you, the person is untrained, you, they can't be carrying any special equipment with them. And so I think this is, it's an urgent problem, and the kind of insight we've had from this uh, series of work uh, can inform this. And people are working on this um, around the world right now. Just in case you um, are feeling, oh, well, India is a special case. That's not at all. This is Boston. Uh, this is the, um, the kind of silliest crosswalk behavior I could find on Google in a uh, in North America. Um, so it's, um, if this, this Subaru in the middle, if that's what it is, is autonomous, what's it going to do? How do you interact with that thing? I think it's a really interesting question, and it, it really matters um, to how soon we can deploy these things. And we, we want to deploy these things. Um, and this is one of, the, uh, most, one of the few things in robotics that's actually urgent. Because right now, we're killing 37,000 people a year in North America. With, in car accidents, and um, injuring many, many times more than that. 37,000, 1.3 million in the world every year, dead people in traffic accidents. And we're able now, or very soon, to make a big dent in that. And so we, we should, and we're trying really hard. I uh, can't think of a more urgent thing to do with the technologies that we've invented recently. 1.3 million people a year. All right. So. Um, Big Hero 6 was a great movie, um, really, I mean, apart from just being beautifully rendered. And also, one of my other th things that I thought was fun about it was that it had the most realistic depiction of grad student robot life I've ever seen. That says uh, attempt no experiment number 33. That's what grad student face looks like. It's quite realistic, I think. And then this is when it worked. <laughs> and then just to prove to you that that's exactly what they do look like, here they are again. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. So um, we hopefully we'll do some questions, but also we have a, a live demo of this. So if you want to try it out after the questions, uh, we'll try and set that up for you. Great. Yeah. In the microphone there. Thank you very much, Richard. That was uh, very insightful. Um, questions from the audience. Do we we have a couple different microphones here? So we'll pass those around. Who wants to start off? I missed, I missed a word there. Can you, can you repeat that last sentence? Pattern. So, like, let's say, like, if we're seeing the forest, is it different from when it is in the ocean? Do you get a lot of pointers, or is it going to be the same? I imagine, like, let's say, a lot of this experiment was in a lab setting, so we already know what kind of pattern is inside the human is going to be very different from that. Versus if it's Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'll just I'll try and summarize the question for the for the tape because it probably didn't hear you. So the question was about whether you need different kinds of interactions with the robot for different settings. Perhaps if you had a specialized setting underwater or in a, a jungle versus the lab, do you have to do things differently? Is that a fair fair summary? Okay. 
Um, yeah, I think um, it's almost always the case that to achieve the best possible performance, you can tune something narrowly for the setting, for example. Um, but in, in the, the great thing about human-robot interaction is that humans are, the common thing to the setting is the human. So human behavior, doing this is very natural, whether you're um, uh, in a forest or a desert or the lab or underwater. So it's an interesting question. May, underwater, you, maybe it's let, slower than two hertz because of the, um, the viscosity of the water might slow you down. That's an experiment we could do. I work with a team of um, people at McGill who do underwater robotics, and we're um, hoping to, um, to port the hand and face detector there. And we, they, we also, our, uh, uh, our waving detector was actually inspired by work that they did where they got their robot to follow a diver um, with the, the flippers. So that was a different frequency. But they, um, the underwater, the visibility is very bad. So the, um, and you don't, once you go deeper than a couple of meters, you don't have red anymore. Um, so things are quite, things look quite different. But th so these motion signals are really useful. So uh, Junaid Sattar, about 10 years ago, managed to follow a diver really well by just looking for the, uh, the frequency of the flippers, and that inspired the, our work. But in general, you're, you're right. We can, um, uh, we can get better performance by tuning for a particular environment. Um, and, but the things that we learn about, the things that humans like to do, those are probably constant and transferable between domains, I think. So we can generalize some, and we can specialize some. But it's an insightful question. Yeah. Um, when you say I have the opportunity this weekend to connect an RCA to the officer who was training dogs for narcotics. And so you had that example up there of the dog leading a visually impaired person. We talk about human and robot interaction. What about animal and robot interaction? Do you think about in um, uh, a war situation? Yeah. Protect the animal when it goes into these yeah, it's a great question. Um, the um, so smell is really interesting. So um, th there's a lot of work been done on um, chemical smell detectors for for defense reasons and for other reasons, for industrial reasons. It turns out to be very difficult. It's it's amazing what the noses of of uh, animals can do, right? So we can make things which are very sensitive to to the presence of molecules. They can smell things. The trouble is wiping the molecules off again. That turns out to be really hard. That's the, and somehow our noses manage that. The best thing with these, these they do these uh, manufacture these polymers and they heat them up and then the molecules ping off. Then it has to cool down again and the whole thing it's like, takes a while, right? So that's what that stuff is like. Um, robots and animals. Um, um, my group are smirking down here because my PhD project was a robot sheepdog. Uh, I made a robot that would uh, gather a flock of real ducks and fetch them where you wanted them. That's the first example of robot and animal uh, robots uh, controlling the behavior of an, a real animal. Um, but that's not quite the question you had, you had in mind. There, is, there was work in about 2002 uh, where people made little backpacks that went on cockroaches, and they put electrodes in the cockroach's brain, and they could actually steer them left or right. Uh, very simple. And so the, I don't think they ever closed the loop and put a sensor package in the backpack, but they could reliably steer the cockroach with a joystick. Until it has sensors on, it's not really a robot. But the proof of concept is that they could actually kind of directly take over the nervous system of the cockroach and, and steer it. Um, and the fantasy, well, fantasy, the concept there was that you'd be able to exploit the chemo sensors of the cockroach that has these incredible evolved chemical sensors, kind of intercept those and make decisions about where to go to maybe find the source of a, a nerve toxin or something like that. But, um, there's a lot of work been done on that over the last uh, 20 years or so, mainly driven by uh, defense. As you, as you I guessed. I see that happening not only in the defense industry, but just practically in real life, perhaps. You know, um, there's a huge investment that's required in these, these seeing eye dogs and these working dogs, and to have a robot work alongside them, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I'm always very careful when dealing with them. Um, because um, the, the, what, the, what dogs do for, for people with, um, with all kinds of disabilities is is very rich and complex, and I, I would I'd be very careful to never make a claim in public that we could do uh, replace them um, substantially. Yeah, maybe there would be an opportunity there. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Really work. Thank you.
Don't be shy. Yeah, so I can answer that in two different ways. So the, uh, on, at least on the level that the robot can say that person is crying and do that reliably, yes, absolutely. We can already kind of do that, and it'll just get, it'll get better very quickly. Yes. No. Does it understand what crying is? That's a different kind of question that I'm not going to attempt. Um, different kind of question. Oh, um, because, yeah, so we, we often do just to make things simpler, but in fact, the, the, the shade of gray changes under different illumination conditions as well. Just, so the, the most obvious example is when the, uh, if the sun comes out, suddenly you've got these new edges everywhere from shadows that weren't there before. Big, big problem. A lot of workers have gone into that. There's a terrific uh, paper by one of our colleagues here, Mark Drew, um, uh, and uh, his colleague in... Uh, in England on um, doing shadow removal, which has been shown to be great. If you just do that before you give the images to the robot, everything gets a bit better. Um, it's a fundamental problem. And, but it, it's given enough data now, we're able to recognize objects under many, many illumination. If, if you can get examples of all the different excuse me, illumination conditions, then we can now do a terrific job with these convolutional neural networks who are able to understand an image and kind of see through all the differences. The way they do that, by the way, is not that complicated. So what they do is they, they project the image up into a very, very large dimensional space, and then, um, and then they organize that projection into a large space so that similar things are kind of nearby each other in some sense. And they kind of draw, you can just you know, slice off all of the clocks and all of the cats and all of the pigs. The trick is exactly what space do you project them into, and that's what's being learned when you learn these neural networks. Yeah, so the question was, do you think, do you have to make the, would it be useful to make the robot look more human? Um, I've deliberately avoided doing anything to manipulate the appearance of the robot at all. I'm um, just to avoid that question. So I'm interested in getting the robot to behave in a way that elicits the right responses from the person. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is to tune a robot into the human's behavior and, and the human's um, sensorium. And I'm not trying to kind of, um, there are lots of people say, what should a robot look like? What's the right kind of robot? Should we make it look more like a human or not? And I'm, I'm looking at another part of that question. Um, one, you probably heard of the uncanny valley phenomenon where you make, you make a uh, robot look more and more realistic. And at one point, it just gets weird because it's creepy now, right? Because the skin is not quite right. And so in that case, it's, it's better just to take the skin off. And then it doesn't look creepy anymore. It just looks like a robot. Um, I'm, I'm happy with either, either of these things. Um, I think, you know, so you do have a... Um, so I think in, in general, um, it, it may not be uh, may not be universally helpful for a robot to look realistically like a human. There's a strong argument to be made for having kind of cartoony looking robots because they elicit the right responses in you. You have a robot with big eyes and a cute round head, and and then um, um, people feel it, will give it attention and, and things like that. So you can manipulate people by making it cartoony. If you make it too realistic, it gets gets weird. We'll come, there'll come a day when it's, it's out the other side and it just looks real, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. How are we doing for time? Yeah. We have a couple more questions and then we can wrap it up. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the uh, great improvement in face and hand identification. Is that mostly just driven by implementing neural networks within the software or what else? Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, is it the neural networks that made the face and hand detection better? The answer is yes. There's a, a, a fairly conventional convolutional neural network, which we trained uh, very carefully. So it, the, a lot of the engineering work gets turned into, how do you train these machines, uh, rather than writing the code, because the code ends up being quite straightforward. But the training is a, a, a new kind of engineering 
it's how to train these neural networks. And a lot of work went into that. And we, um, uh, we made some, um, we used a few data sets that we found um, uh, from the academic community. And we also made our own data set, which includes these images taken from UAVs with humans in front, which is, you, no, one's, no one's produced these data before. So we've released these so other people can train on our data as well. When you're deciding which project to move on to, how do you know all that? Do you even like think of some other commercial applications from like some other people, like companies with like million dollar budgets, are developing the same technology? So at some point you'll just give up because you have more competition in that side. So how do you decide, and then how do you? What do you do if this happens? Yeah. So how to decide when to stop a research avenue because it's too close to, to commerce? Um, I wouldn't. By the way, I wouldn't say give up. I, it's quite the opposite. Like we had, we achieved. We ex explained how to do enough things that now industry can do it by itself. Uh, so the opposite of give up. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for you. I, I, do, I, I definitely feel like it's my obligation to do things which are out a bit and, and maybe too risky for a company to do because the chances of getting it to work are too small for them. The chances of making money off it in the next seven years are too small for them. We can try stuff and fail. It doesn't matter too much. Um, the students learn stuff in the process. They might be looking pained right now as I say that. But um, um, I mean, I, I take the responsibility seriously. We're spending taxpayers' money. We should do stuff that the taxpayer wouldn't get otherwise. Um, so it's just intuition and experience. And then, of course, the, if, in terms of the, the direction about what to do, I, I just do stuff that interests me. Um, so I'm, I'm optimizing for interesting. Um, and with some, um, uh, some other weighted factors are how likely is it we can actually make progress? Uh, there's the, the, what's the student experience like? Can we actually do something in the student's lifetime that is not whole lifetime, you know, university tenure um, that, that we can do? Um, uh, can we afford to do it? You know, so I, um, I'm working at a company now where we can, if we choose to do something, we can spend a lot of money to do it. And the, the problems you can tackle that were totally different than we can do at university. But my job is to make sure that we're doing complementary stuff at the university um, that the companies wouldn't do otherwise. Well, I, that was really interesting. And I am very excited to the point when I can get my own little robot butler at home. The, uh, the idea of coming down with the breakfast made and the coffee ready and me just waving at it and it coming over like a little puppy is fantastic. And it's great to see this innovation coming at us, a few, and, and all the great work you guys are doing. Um, I please invite everybody to, um, to come and engage more with Richard. There's going to be a, a demo as well uh, after this in here. But outside, we also have some re re refreshments uh, for everyone to, to mingle and, and continue the conversation. Um, on behalf of Key, I'd like to, to thank you all uh, again for coming to this uh, session as part of our Data Visionary series. Uh, I'd also like to extend an invitation to you all on December the 6th we will be having a public lecture. Uh, Jeff Rosen Rosenthal will be speaking, and he'll be talking about the concept of luck and sharing his surprising findings on, the, uh, on luck from a statistical perspective. Uh, so it'll be a very interesting uh, talk on, on the 6th uh, of December uh, coming up. And so you can actually register for that on the SFU's Eventbrite page by searching the puzzle of luck. Um, and again, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming to this session. And um, I don't know if you're ready for doing the demo now or... That's running. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll jump right into the demo. Yeah. Cheers. Well, thanks very much. So, yeah, go ahead, Toby. We'll walk it around. So this, this is the hand and face tracker running on the, uh, on the vehicle right now. So why don't you show it your hands and your faces? There you go. Again. So the, it's, the lights, uh, this thing is tuned for outdoors where the light's usually brighter. So this is actually, it's working pretty hard. So you're, you're looking at the best, uh, the best hand tracker in the world that, uh, that does faces for free. <laughs> so I if, have to mention, oh, sorry. No. Yeah, go ahead. We have a limitation on number of detection. We just put that limitation like 30 people. So it might not be like everyone here. It's got stuck. That's it. I just wanted you to, I wanted the robot to feel you before we let you go. 
All right. Well, thanks very much for, uh, for your attention today. I enjoyed it. Thank you.